Hello and welcome to the second video in this series. In the first one, we looked at how to manage the frost and culling of millions of objects on huge terrains in a performant way, so that we know which of those objects are visible to the camera for the current frame. There should be a link to that video in the top right if you missed it. What interests us today is how to render these different visible objects in a performant way, so that we can handle in the order of 100,000 visible elements of different types. In addition, we want to be able to highlight certain individual objects to relay information to the player. For example, an object could be selected, or we may want to indicate the range of a building or an action's impact by tinting the objects in range. We will also consider some nifty tricks to reduce the number of draw calls we require to render everything. At the end of the previous culling video, each object had a position, scale and rotation converted into a transformation matrix and a bounding box, and our output was a native list indicating for each of up to millions of objects whether the object is currently visible or not. However, it's not just a true or false flag, but rather a byte value from 0 to 255. The reason for this range of values is that we also want to use the culling step to determine which level of detail or LOD to display for the object. To improve performance, it is standard practice for each object to have a range of meshes in decreasing quality or level of detail associated with it. When the object takes up a large enough part of the displayed scene, the most detailed version is rendered, so that we observe the best quality version consisting of the most triangles when it matters. However, the smaller the object becomes on the displayed scene, the more this quality or detail is wasted since the object becomes so small that the detail gets lost. It is then more performant to display a mesh of lesser quality or fewer triangles, for little or even no reduction in perceived detail. More LODs can be added for when the object becomes even smaller, and eventually the object can be culled completely, if it becomes too small to play a significant part in the displayed scene. In my implementation, I use distance from camera to determine the LOD required to be rendered, with each object type being calibrated to a certain base maximum distance related to its size and importance. This simplifies the calculations required to determine the required LOD. To cater for all of this, we need to expand on the Visuals Manager clause that we created in the culling video. First off, we link each object to its object type which is mainly the mesh and material it represents. Then we have a native list for instance data, which will contain various bits of information that shaders will use to highlight or tint individual objects to provide feedback to the player. Then we introduce a new native memory container called a native multi hash map. This is a two dimensional container allowing us to store more than one object index for each object type and LOD combination. We create one hash map for non-instance objects and one for instanced objects. Next, we have two native lists again to link each object type and LOD combination to its key in the hash map and to calibrate LOD ranges of the object types. Finally, we have an instance of a job that will convert the output of the culling step into a list of visible objects for each object type and LOD combination. Of course, we need to allocate memory for our new variables and also remember to dispose of them on shutdown. We also create the job instance and link the native containers to their counterparts in the job. Then, each frame, we can schedule the job and wait for it to complete. Inside the job, the output from the culling step is interpreted as what percentage of the maximum distance from the camera before being culled the object is. If the output value is 100 or more, the object is culled, while the LODs increase in detail the closer to zero the value moves. Each object type can also be calibrated to define at which distance the worst LOD should start. For example, for important objects, the worst LOD may only kick in at 70, while for less significant objects, the worst LOD may kick in at 40. All the other LODs are then spread evenly on the remaining range. Each object type and LOD combination gets a key that represents it in the hash map and, if the currently considered object is visible, its index is added to its hash map key. Note how the object is slotted into the instanced version of the hash map if its instance data is set to something different from zero, 
which is the indication that it's a special case. After the job finishes, the hash maps will contain lists of object indices that should be rendered for each object type and lot combination. We now need to send this information to the GPU to be rendered. However, we still only know the object indices, while the GPU requires positions, rotations and scales in a transformation matrix. In the culling video, we saw that when we add objects to the scene, the position, rotation and scale are combined into a 4x4 transformation matrix for each object, which is what the GPU can consume. So we need another step to convert the lists of object indices into lists of matrices. Now, since each object type and lot combination has its own mesh and material, and some objects consist of more than one mesh and material combination, each combination will require a draw call. For example, a tree may have three separate meshes and three materials for the leaves, the trunk and the roots. It makes sense to keep all the information about an object type together in a class, add a list of lot mesh renderers to it, and then let each lot mesh renderer handle its own draw call. It links to the mesh and possible submesh index it represents and contains a render parameters specification that has previously been set up from the material the mesh or submesh should be rendered with, including a version for the highlighted instances. Without going into the detail, here you can see how the render parameters have been set up. As mentioned before, each of these mesh and material combinations has a hash map key, and in our previous job, the hash maps have already been populated with a list of object indices that correspond to every key. All we need to do now is to fetch the matrices of the visible objects, but each lot mesh renderer should extract only its own cases and populate its rendering data with them. To do this, each lot mesh renderer will create its own job and link both the overall culling data and its own local data to the job. Each frame, the job will only be called if an instanced or non-instanced object of that type and the lot is visible. This is determined by querying the hash maps to see how many visible entries this key has stored against it. We would run through all the lot mesh renderers and schedule their jobs so that the first one can start running while we're scheduling the others. Then we wait until they have all completed. We'll consider what happens in the job soon. But let's first see what we do with its outputs. The outputs of the job are a list of non-instanced matrices containing the data the GPU requires to set the position, rotation and scale of each visible object, plus an instanced version with the accompanying instances buffer, which contains the special data that tells the shaders what specifically to do for each instanced object. If we ignore the indirect versions for now and just quickly display its code for those who might benefit from it, the actual render calls are fairly straightforward. We use graphics.rendermesh instanced, supply the render parameters, mesh and submesh index, an array of the matrices in view, and how many instances should be rendered. The instanced case works the same, although we also have to send the instance data to the GPU by attaching the instances buffer to the render parameters material. Let's have a quick look at the job itself. First off, Note that each instance of a job is executed on a single worker thread, since we're using iJob rather than iJob parallel 4. However, there will be one job for each visible lot mesh of each visible object type. So plenty of jobs will be kicked off, and having each job run on a different available parallel thread improves performance significantly. In terms of what happens in the job, we start by clearing all the lists to get rid of the previous frame's output. Next, we start moving through the hash map, processing each visible entry for our key one by one. In essence, we simply copy the values corresponding to the visible objects of this LOD from the overall matrices native list into the local matrices in view native list. I've just added a step here that allows us to smoothly scale the object up or down to its required end scale, which adds some juice to placing objects. For example, the way the trees quickly grow into place when placed. The instanced case works exactly the same, just includes copying over the instance data as well. We will not go into the code of the indirect rendering case in detail. It gets quite complex rather quickly. However, I again include the code here for anyone who could benefit from it. 
It took me quite a while to finally figure out how to do it correctly, so I hope it can save someone some time. What I will do is show what I use it for, and why. If we want to have tens of thousands of animated animals and people on the map, conventional animation methods where each unit has an attached animator that calculates each individual's armature or rig every frame becomes too slow. Instead, I wrote an editor tool that steps through the unit animation at a pace of 30 frames per second and captures each frame as a submesh of the unit's overall mesh. That combined mesh would be the mesh for my unit type. I would also include different lots. In the game, in a threader job, I advance each unit's animation time and move it over to the next pre-captured frame one by one as it passes the timing thresholds. Now we can handle each possible frame as similar to a separate object type, again with its lots, and have a draw call for each frame that has some visible units in that pose at that time. However, this means that we could have thousands of draw calls for thousands of different frame snapshots across different animals and humans, and that tanked the frame rate. So I expanded on this. I added all the frames into a single mesh with only one submesh, containing everything as one huge mesh. But I also saved how many frames each animation clip has. This means I can calculate exactly which sub-interval of vertices in the huge mesh represents which frame of which animation clip. If we now set up the graphics buffers that goes into the indirect rendering calls correctly, each rendered instance will only render the sub-range of vertices or triangles that correspond to that frame of that animation. This allows me to render all frames of all animations of a lot of a unit or animal type with one indirect rendering call, greatly reducing the number of draw calls required to have a variety of animals and humans on the map. Another technique that I've employed to improve performance on the rendering side is to pre-combine meshes for objects that share the same type of shader and material. For example, I have these nine flower types that all use the same shader for their wind reactor version and the same shader for its windless version. I created a scriptable object that takes as input the different lots of their meshes as well as their materials. It then combines all the lots of all the meshes of all the flowers into one large mesh, keeping track of at which vertex each new lot starts and how many vertices and triangles it consists of. I also combine all the textures of the different materials into one texture array for each functional set. Finally, I created a version of the shader that works with texture arrays rather than individual textures, and also can handle both wind effective and still rendering. This means I'm packing a myriad of small meshes into a single mesh and all 18 materials into a single material. This allows me to use a single indirect draw call to render all lots, wind reactive or not, of all nine flower types. Finally, I sneak the index of the texture array to use for each vertex and triangle range into a spare channel on the mesh data, so that the shader will know which index to sample from. This allows me to render all visible objects of all lots of all nine flowers in a single indirect draw call even if there are a hundred thousand visible instances of them. I intend to implement a similar solution for crops, trees, etc. where it makes sense. My final trick for now is concerned with having some visual variety in the humans. I have a variety of different hats, clothes, faces, accessories, etc. available for my human meshes. I could create, say, ten pre-combined groups of meshes to have ten different looking possible humans. Each of them would require a draw call, which isn't too bad for only 10 varieties. But we could also combine all of them, plus all the materials in a similar way to the flowers we've just discussed. However, I've devised a way that allows me to dynamically pick any of the hats, any of the clothes, any of the faces, etc. for each individual unit, allowing a wide range of variant combinations, all using the same draw call to render. I do this by combining all the possible meshes into the same mesh, but sneak in some metadata in a spare channel. The instance data for each unit then packs together which option was picked for that unit for each of the variables, which hat, which face, etc. The shader then ignores or culls all the hat options except the one indicated in the instance data. 
This does mean each unit has quite a few wasted triangles in its mesh that needs to be processed and culled by the GPU, but as long as you don't overdo it, the gain in variability and being able to render all of them in one draw call makes it worth it. And that's it for this video. The next video will be about how to adapt your shaders to allow instanced rendering, with some metadata sent through for each instance to tell the shader how to process it correctly. Please let me know in the comments which technical areas you would like more detail about, and subscribe to this channel, wishlist and follow Minor Deity on Steam, or join the Discord server to stay up to date. All the links are down below. Also, feel free to ask specific questions you may have. Thanks for your time and support.